All right, welcome to DDS and Radio episode four. We'll go ahead and go over the Super Tuesday slate from last night. We had some huge games, and let's go ahead and go over them in detail. We'll check out some of the box scores and team stats that way y'all, to get, help give you all a better understanding of what went on. Let's go ahead and start off with the first game that we had last night, and that was the Florida Atlantic Owls against the Illinois Final Lion. I was trying to think who played last night. Illinois went on to win the game 98 to 89. Here's the team stats uh, pulled up right here. So one thing that plagued Florida Atlantic last night and has plagued them uh, in the tournament and probably will be the same story this year is Vlad Golden. Yes, he's their best player, but also if he's gone, they have a massive hole on the interior of their defense um, that, you know, they they have uh, they have other bigs that are backups, but they're more uh, they're undersized. They're not as big as Golden. Obviously, he's one of the best centers in the country, and and it showed last night. Looking at the stats here, I was kind of I was kind of surprised that Florida Atlantic finished with more rebounds than Illinois, because Illinois was dominating the paint. Terrence Shannon Jr. and Damas Senior, uh, they both scored over thirty points. I believe Shannon had thirty three. Damas had thirty one. I may have that backwards. But, um, yeah, they just dominated the paint. They were really the only ones that were scoring for Illinois, and that was just them getting the ball to the to the bucket. Uh, Golden only played 19 minutes, and Shannon and Damas played about 33, 34 minutes. So they basically played the whole game, except for a five-minute breather throughout. Uh, they were out there the whole time. And this Illinois team, they're senior-led. This is a veteran squad. FAU, yes, they've been there before last year. But they were a very young squad last year. They were filled with freshmen, sophomores, a lot of underclassmen. So they're still pretty young, even though they're a bit seasoned now. But these are, I'm talking about older as in like grown. So we have a, they, uh, Illinois has a bunch of super seniors, uh, six year seniors like Terrence Shannon Jr. And uh, Terrence Shannon Jr. has been doing this at a high level for a long time, going back to his days at Texas Tech, where he was, I, I believe he started for his freshman, sophomore years. So. He has plenty of he has plenty of experience, and his show last night he was a man amongst boys. It felt like uh, getting to the bucket, just doing it too easily. Same thing with Damas. He's a senior. He hit almost all of his shots, and as you can see here, Illinois shot uh, sixty three percent for the whole game. That means these guys were just a dead on. And what hurt Florida Atlantic earlier in the game was their turnovers. They finished with. 13 turnovers, but at the beginning of the game, that it, it, it killed them. They were just, uh, they had at least, I counted at least four traveling calls in the first half. So just that alone, just giving Illinois extra possessions. And when you're giving a team extra possessions that's shooting 60% uh, from the field, and at the time they were shooting it from the three point line as well. Um, you're, you're more than likely not going to win that game. So this was a huge learning experience for Florida Atlantic. Um, the backup centers, they, they just could not handle Illinois inside. Uh, Dang Danger was able to get whatever he wanted uh, offensively regarding rebounds, same thing. Uh, the problem is if Golden gets in foul trouble that early, FAU doesn't have a shot. I mean, only playing 19 minutes, and they, they lose by nine points. And like I said, Shannon and DeMass, they took full advantage of that time Golden was out. They just got the ball to the bucket just too easily. There's nobody there to stop them. And whenever uh, the guards try to play defense and stop them, uh, you know, they, they foul them inside. So uh, it was not a good night for Florida Atlantic, and they're going to need to figure out something uh, when foul, when Vlad Golden gets into foul trouble. So... That was that was a good game, but Illinois, for the most part, the whole second half, they pretty much they pretty much dominated the game, and it it, it was their it basically it's just a veteran squad. They're older. They're a great defensive team, a great rebounding team, and like I said, when their shots are falling, they're able to get to the bucket that easily for open layups, uh, shooting sixty three percent. Then they're not going to lose very many games, and. Um, Florida Atlantic, they had a great game. They had a good game. Excuse me. They they had a good game. Uh, for their for their standards, they didn't have a. It, it wasn't a great night, honestly. Uh, Illinois was a better team for I would say the whole forty minutes. It it, it felt like Florida Atlantic was playing behind. Like, uh, whenever they didn't have a lead, uh, a, a large lead that that is. Uh, it, Florida Atlantic, it felt like they were playing behind about five seven points the whole game. 
and uh, they they just couldn't catch up. And uh, a lot of that was attributed to not having Golden out there. And Dusty May, he pulled him out after one foul for I mean he he missed like the vast majority of that first half, and then he picked up I want to say another foul, a second foul uh, with less than ten minutes left. And we really didn't see him again for the for for the whole first half and spotty in the second half. Uh, he still let the he still let the team in scoring in uh, in only 19 minutes. So then you got to ask, well, where were the guards? Where was the three point shooting? The three point shooting that wasn't there, uh, which they shot decent, I believe. They shot about what was it, 40, 39 percent, which you know that's still pretty decent. Illinois shot 40, uh, but it was just the turnovers. And if you can see here, the field goals. And uh, Florida Atlantic, they, they shot the ball seven more times and didn't even matter. They they missed them. Illinois shot the ball seven less times and made five more field goals. So they, they took advantage of their easy shots, something that Florida Atlantic wasn't able to get. And that was pretty much what plagued them. And Illinois, this is going to be a big 10, a big 10 team to look for uh, during the regular season. During the postseason, I think with their, uh, like I said, their they play defense, they rebound, they could score like they did last night, take advantage of smaller opponents, then yeah, they have a chance, but um, I don't think they're uh, dynamic enough, uh, if that makes sense. I don't think they're dynamic enough to make a, a, a run in March. I could be wrong, but they've had really good teams the past few years, and they weren't able to do anything. And maybe this team that doesn't have as much talent but they do all the little things right. Maybe that 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 might be the game changer for Illinois. We'll have to wait and see. So uh, I was really impressed with the, the Lionize uh, performance last night. And FAU has a lot to work on, uh, but they have plenty of time before tournament time rolls around. All right, let's get into one of my favorite games from last night, which we hit this nail on the head directly. Providence visiting Oklahoma. We got Oklahoma as one of the best teams in the country that – no one seems to talk about, not even the Sooners themselves. I was watching this Providence-Oklahoma game, and there's not very many people in the crowd, which is crazy to me. I know oh, it's not even, I mean, it's not even the holidays yet, you know, Christmas season or uh, the end of uh, the semester for students. So I don't, I don't know how there wasn't that many people at the Providence-Oklahoma game last night. Uh, I know Sooners, they love their football and basketball, but and their softball. But this this Oklahoma team, I'm telling you, they, they've got everything you want in a hard-nosed basketball team with a great coach in Porter Moser and who who does the most with the least. But now he's got he's he's got some great players. And let's pull up the let's pull up the box score here and talk about this game. Uh Tech or not Texas, Oklahoma went out to a huge 12-0 run to start this game. But Providence was able to score 11 straight points just by Devin Carter himself, which and, and at that point, obviously, he was the only person who had scored. So you would think like, OK, Oklahoma, you know, they they should be able to get a little bit of a lead here uh, or something to shut down Carter and they'll be fine. So this game, for the most part, went back and forth in the first half. Uh, Oklahoma would go up three, five, ten points. Providence would go on a little run. Uh, the one thing that I noticed and that could be an issue with Oklahoma is their big men on defense. Uh, Providence doesn't have the best big man, but their center was silky smooth and he was making every fadeaway jumper, every little hook shot, baby hook, turn around, and he was making the right backdoor passes. So if Oklahoma can tighten up in the paint defensively, I think they'd be they're perfectly fine. It's still early in the season. Um, what? Yeah, they're only eight games in. So it's early in the season. But this is just something I noticed. What well, that was the only time Providence would get easy shots was and this is in the first half, is when they would get the ball down the post and one on one and the center just couldn't handle them. And it wasn't the center's fault. Providence players just playing money. But in the second half, that kind of changed. Oklahoma was able to push out and get the big man out and away from the basket and force Providence to play on the perimeter, which they they cannot do. And the, that's that's where Oklahoma excelled in the second half. They went up. Uh, I think Providence had a one-point lead, and after that, Oklahoma just beat the shit out of them. They really did. Uh, they played great defense. They were all over the perimeter, forcing bad shots, getting the rebound, hustling for every play. 
I was really impressed with this Oklahoma. I mean, I love this Oklahoma team, so of course I was impressed. But the way they handled the adversity in the first half, uh, blowing that 12-point lead, and then coming back and just dominating the rest of the way the whole second half, starting with their defense, and they're making their open threes. And the one thing I do like about this Oklahoma team is they the guards love to get the ball into the paint, and they could shoot that floater. They can shoot that mid-range jumper. Owe, McCullough, uh, Uday. I mean, these guys, uh, Uzan, 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 excuse me, Uzan, sophomore. I, I always call them Juzang, Luzang, Uzang. Uh, I mean, th th this seems good, and nobody's talking about them, which, whatever, right? Uh, once conference play starts and they start playing Big 12 opponents, we'll see how good they are, but, I mean, they're passing the eye test with flying colors, uh, especially because they're using they're playing defense first, and then they have a strong offense. So defense are rebounding with this Oklahoma team, and we'll take a look at the box, box score here. Uh, Oklahoma out rebounded one of the top rebounding teams in the country. I mean, they're in the top 25, I would say, uh, Providence is in rebounding. And I, I don't know, I haven't looked at it today, but at least as of yesterday, they were Oklahoma out rebounded them 40 to 23, 10 offensive rebounds to their one. I mean, they just dominated the boards, 12 steals, six blocks, forced 15 turnovers. They need to cut down their own turnovers. Uh, but I mean, just a great game from Oklahoma. They get to the line 11 times, miss one. That's great. Field goal percentage. They shot what eight more field goals and made seven more. So this was such a, uh, an efficient and great game from Oklahoma. And as you can see here, they held Providence only 20 points in the second half. They shut them down. And like I said, it was an easy fix. It was an easy fix because they're getting killed by two players, the Providence center and then Carter. And they, they shut down Carter in the second half. He wasn't getting those open buckets. He made some tough shots, but that's because he's a really good point guard. But Oklahoma, they were able to dominate uh, defensively, and and it turned out to be a runaway winner, 21-point uh, win. And we have two tickets on Oklahoma, each at 150-1. to one. Uh, This Sooners team, they're going to make a run. If they stay healthy, they're going to make a run. A team that can score, play great defense and rebound the way they're rebounding. And they have a coach in Porter Moser who's taken um, Loyola Chicago to the final four elite eight before. I mean, yeah, they're uh, the Sooners team's in good hands. I really love what Oklahoma's doing right now. They're only going to get better. And I honestly can't wait to watch them uh, play again, because like I said, uh, they're, they're not getting the respect, but they're one of the best teams in the country right now. And I will, uh, and I'll keep shouting from the rooftops until somebody beats them and they're going to have a great season. I can't wait to watch more of them. All right, let's talk about the game of the night, the heavyweight matchup, Madison Square Garden, North Carolina Tar Heels against the Yukon Huskies. This was a great game from start to finish. Uh, Yukon flex their muscles. They showed why they are. You know, I have them rated as the third best team in the country, and that's only because they lost to Kansas. It was a road game, but like I like we talked about last uh, yesterday's episode of uh, the teams that we have ranked from first to six and mainly the top three they're interchangeable in my opinion as the best team in the country we'll see what arizona can do this coming week but uh let's talk about last night's game let me bring up the box score here i mean this this is going to tell us a lot of what what happened last night uconn I mean, I think North Carolina has just as much talent and they can compete with UConn. The difference is uh, the Tar Heels bench. They don't have a bench like like UConn does. Um, I know Hubert's probably trying to figure out who to come off the bench, who can make shots, and really they, they don't really have anybody. UConn, on the other hand, they got Diara. They've got uh, Castle or Ball, which everyone doesn't start, comes in off the bench. And, I mean, these guys come in, make shots, contribute immediately. That's what North Carolina is missing. They have, um, they, ha they have some bench players that come in, but um, they're, not, they're not tested, and they're not, I don't think, as the, uh, the same level as the UConn players. Uh, so let's get into this here. Uh, w something that was glaring in this game was the ability – of UConn to knock down all their easy shots. Anytime that they had an open open three, open jumper, open layup, boom, 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 they knocked it down. There's a reason why they shot 60% in the first half. They're hitting 
all their open shots. This is something North Carolina struggled with. Harrison Ingram would get the ball in the paint. He'd miss a layup, miss a contested layup. Armando Baycott, same thing, put back, miss it, miss it, contest it, contest it. They contest everything, and North Carolina struggled with that. UConn, on the other hand, they made those contested shots, and to me, that was the difference in the game. Uh, you, you can say what you want about the three-point shooting. North Carolina got their threes in at the end of the game, and you know UConn still had three more. Ten three-pointers at 30%, but it felt like they were shooting 60% in that first half. Another is the field goal percentage. A lot of that had to do with North Carolina missing so many easy shots. And we're going to go ahead. We're not going to pin this on somebody. We're going to go ahead and call, call it out, though. Cormac Ryan, poor guy. He was he shot, I, I want to say, at least two three-pointers that I saw. They were halfway down and rimmed out. Would have been game-changing three-pointers. But his problem is he's 0, he was 0 for 6 on the at the free-throw line. You can't do that. I mean, what did North Carolina have? They had uh, seven, eight, nine missed free throws. He missed six free throws. He was 0 for 6 from the free throw line. You can't do that. You can't do that, especially if he's supposed to be a knockdown three-point shooter. He plays pretty decent defense, but my goodness, he could not make a free throw. saved his life, and it, it cost North Carolina the cover. The free throws did. Uh, and as a North Carolina backer, yeah, that's that's kind of frustrating and annoying. Uh, what else happened? Th- this North or this this Connecticut team, uh, I tweeted it out last night. They're just a machine. Everyone's moving around constantly, which is great team basketball. They've got some, you know, they've got some McDonald's All American players, but they got some guys like um, Spencer and Newton, who you know, they're these guys grinded it out, and now they're real players. And they're just this is just team basketball all the way around. You have clean in the middle. And then Tristan Newton at the point, and and the other three wings, they're moving around constantly, screening, backdoor, trying to roll off, pop open for three. They're doing it all. And if you watched the game last night, it was evident. Same thing against the Texas game. <coughs> Except I want to say UConn made some more three-pointers against Texas, but it's the same thing, and they kept up with Kansas. Same thing. They're just constantly moving. Somebody's always open. And the North Carolina defense, they just kept getting lost. And between the free throws, the miss layups, the miss defensive assignments, North Carolina wasn't ready. And, and this UConn team is playing like a national championship team in, De- in, in the first week of December. It's not even March. It's not even February yet, much less March. North Carolina, like I, I, I say this weekly, right? Th- they've got the talent and they'll get there. Withers, he's got to bring something to the table. This guy's about six, ten, seven feet, and he's just slow, just moving slow. And you're seeing Klingon, you're seeing Johnson come in for UConn, and he's just he's two steps behind these guys, three steps behind them, and his kid it was killing North Carolina on the boards. So when Baycott's out of this game, out of the game, uh, Withers has got to do something uh, defensively on the rebounds. He's just. He's just moving way too slow for the Tar Heels. And Cado, he's a really good point guard, fast. He's way too fast for his own feet right now. He's a freshman. He needs to slow down a little bit. But a lot of that speed and quickness, that's like his advantage. And, you know, what he excels at. But sometimes he just goes a little too fast, turnovers, you know, same old, same old. But I thought this was a great game. Uh, UConn is just... They're just they're just they're just playing at a March level in the first week of December, which is kind of crazy, but that's the type of level they're at. So now you know where they are in comparison to to North Carolina. North Carolina is close, and maybe they can get there at the end of the year, but they got to figure out their bench because there's gonna be nights where Baycott will get in foul trouble, where Cormac Ryan's not making free throws or his threes, and Cadeau Cadeau who knows what Cadeau's doing. But and Harrison Ingram, he he was knocked down from three point shooting, played great defense. And whenever he got the ball in the paint, contested shots, he missed it. They missed the tips and it killed North Carolina. This was a great game. Great uh, measuring stick for both both teams. Um, But yeah, look at that. The rebounding, the three point shooting, the assists. UConn just dominated. Just they were just a machine. I mean, it was a close game, but. You know, North Carolina was just two steps behind all night, and 
and you know it just it just built and built and built and it just and it ended up what 11 point game um but uh it was a good game a lot of work for the tar heels tar heels still need a lot of work and yukon at this point they just want everyone to stay healthy because they're fi they're firing on all cylinders i wouldn't I, I i didn't and i wouldn't count that kansas game against them because on a as you can see here on a neutral floor which in march is the only thing that matters they're a tough team. They're a tough team, and uh, they're they're right now. I would say the favorite to win the national championship, which isn't anything out of the ordinary. Uh, I know that's not a hot take, but um, yeah, this UConn team, they're they're a problem. They're a problem. All right, let's go over to night's games. There's not a huge slate like there was last night, but there's some pretty good games that I I saw on this on the on the schedule today. So let's start off with one very intriguing game, which is a Big East versus a Big Twelve matchup, and that's going to be the Pitt Panthers against the West Virginia Mountaineers, an old backyard rivalry, backyard brawl, I believe it's called. Uh, Pittsburgh, they're coming off a home loss to Clemson, which I thought Pittsburgh would win that game at home. Uh, Pitt's got some pretty good size, and that's pretty much the only, I want to say that's the only thing West Virginia's got going for them. They got a seven-footer from the Netherlands. He's pretty good inside the paint, but he got in a foul trouble against uh, against St. John's last weekend, and they just, they couldn't, they couldn't rebound. They couldn't stop anything inside the paint. So if he gets in foul trouble again, I think Pittsburgh will have uh, have a good game. Because Pittsburgh does have a better offense than St. John's, so I think they should be able to match up well with West Virginia. I don't think this is a game I would want to bet on West Virginia because basically they 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 jack up wild three pointers and they get their big man in, involved. And if he's in foul trouble, they just jack up three pointers and they can't rebound. So it, it, I don't think I'll bet on this game, but uh, I will be looking forward to watching it or at least keeping up with it. Uh, because you never know this pit team. I thought they'd, they, I thought they'd be Clemson. I don't know how good they are just yet. So this is a big test for Pitt, and I'm looking forward to it. Another game we have on the slate. This is a night game. I want to say it's, uh, tips at nine central, uh, SMU travels to Tempe to take on Arizona state. This is going to be a great game because what, what we'll have here is a duel of two full court pressing teams. SMU likes to press full court for the most part, and Arizona State, that's the only way that they can survive is pressing full court. Arizona State has a, in my opinion, they have a terrible offense. Uh, their defense creates their offense, and don't get me wrong, some nights, Arizona, a night. I think Arizona, Arizona State against Vanderbilt hit 60% from the three-point line, hit more three-pointers than they have all season. Um and will that happen again? I don't know. They dominated San Francisco last week. So Arizona State all of a sudden is on a two-game winning streak. So we'll see how SMU fares. This is going to be a tough test for SMU offensively. If they're able to break the press, which they should be used to doing, I think they'll have success. I'll probably back SMU in this game. I'm waiting to see how the spread lines up. Like I said, this game's not until 9 Central. But right now I want to say uh, SMU is getting 3.5, maybe 4 points. Uh, and I think that's good enough to take take SMU because um, skill wise, I think they're very similar. And like I said, it's going to be a battle of who has the better press, who forces the most turnovers. And at the end of the day, if SMU can make some three pointers more than Arizona State, they'll win. I, it, it seems to be if Arizona State, which is a very rare occasion, if Arizona State makes a three pointers, they can win the game when they're playing good defense. But like I said, it's very rare. Uh, I like SMU in this game. I think they have the superior press and the better offense, and I, I'm looking forward to a, to a, to a running gun uh, track meet tonight. Uh, let's see here. We have another one, uh, a, a undefeated rivalry game. South Carolina goes to Clemson, take on the undefeated Tigers. Both teams, like I said, 7-0, and and this should be a great game. Clemson, like I said, coming off of a win at Pitt. It was a huge win. Joe Girard went off from the three-point line. They're definitely going to need that again. Uh, what impressed me with Clemson was their, their post players. They were able to get rebounds and facilitate. Very good rebounding team and, the, and a pretty good defensive team. South Carolina, on the other hand, they play defense. Frank Martin's their head coach. They play defense. And they can shoot the three pointer, and they have uh, they they have pretty close numbers to Clemson. Uh, both of them match up almost. 
identically, honestly, uh, other than the three point shooting for South Carolina, it's one of the best in the country. Clemson's not very far away. And uh, I think this game, I think there's too many points here. I want to say it's an eight and a half spread. Um, if it's eight and a half, I'll probably take South Carolina in a rivalry game. Both teams very confident. Both teams undefeated. Should be a great game. Uh, fun one to watch as well. And that leads us into our main event. Texas goes into Wisconsin to face Marquette in the Pfizer Center. Uh, Pfizer Forum, excuse me. And uh, we've got two top teams here. And Shaka Smart obviously used to coach at UT. So this is going to be storylines galore. Marquette coming off that loss against Wisconsin. They're going to want to get a win. And the Longhorns, they're going to want to get a they're going to want to get a win to show that they're, you know, they're the real deal. And that's something that they wanted to get against UConn, but they're banged up. No Shedrick, no Disu. Of course, no Disu tonight, but Shedrick should be playing starting and i think texas matches up well defensively and this is gonna be a defensive game for sure defense and three-point shooting uh, uh, because that's what marquette likes to do uh i i kind of explained this in the past you get daro he's got a nice little floater in the paint but this texas team at full health they'll be good later in the season but right now i'm considering no disu full health for the longhorns the shedrick's in there uh, you know, I talked about it yesterday. I love the way Dylan Mitchell's been playing Max Amos. You know, he's got that underdog mentality. And of course we got good old reliable Brock Cunningham. So this should be a great game. I don't think it'll be a, uh, um, I don't want to say upset. I meant a uh, blowout or anything like that. I think it'll be closed because like I said, Texas, they want to defeat their old coach. Not, not necessarily these players old coach, but they want to defeat the coach that used to coach at UT, Shaka Smart. And same thing with Shaka. He's going to want to beat Texas. So this is going to be a great game, great environment. And I really can't wait to watch this one. I'll probably film, uh, not film, but stream this one live on Twitch. Uh, at least my watch along, not the actual game live. Um, this one tips at seven. So I'll probably take uh, eight, eight and a half points with the Longhorns. I'll take the points here. And, you know, it's going to basically going to be a defensive and three point shooting contest. Uh, Texas has the advantage in the post. And if they stay out of foul trouble and get Marquette into foul trouble, that's how they can gain the advantage. But I like the Longhorns tonight, which should be a great game. Uh, like I said, it's a short slate, but that's all we have today. And I hope you all enjoy the games. We'll be back to recap tomorrow and head into Thursday and see what kind of basketball we got going. All right. Thanks, guys.